If you had told me two years ago that I would convince this many people to subscribe to a statistics YouTube channel, I probably would have called you a liar, but here we are. First, I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for giving your time to this project of mine and allowing me to achieve a goal that I've had since high school. I'm excited to continue helping people get better at statistics, and I hope you'll stick with me along the way. But my life is changing in a big way soon, and to keep this channel going, it has to change as well. I'll explain what this means exactly at the end of the video, so stay tuned. Before that, I asked if any of you had questions for me, and I'm here to answer the ones that I got. If you're new here, my name's Christian, and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. What made you pick biostatistics, rather than just statistics? Uh, when I was an undergrad, I did biomedical engineering. I thought it was a nice compromise between something I liked, which was building things, and something my parents liked, earning money as a doctor. I even tried balancing engineering classes with pre-med classes, which totally nuked my GPA. After graduating, I realized that I really liked working with problems in a medical context, but I just wasn't going to cut it as a doctor. A bit later, I took on a job as a data analyst at the UC Davis Medical Center, where I met a biostatistician for the first time. I saw that they had a ton of smart people also seeking out their help. And that told me that statistics was just one of those things that people would always need help on, no matter how smart you were. Medical problems plus statistics is biostatistics. So that's how I stumbled onto this path. I know PhDs require you to do both research and teach. How do you plan to accomplish both goals? Will you be at university or industry? Even though I've just finished my PhD, I honestly feel like I'm just getting to the starting line when it comes to learning about clinical trials and experimental design. What you might not know is that pharmaceutical companies also publish a lot of papers, since they're at the forefront of novel experimental designs, and actually have the capital to pull these designs off. I'll get more into this later, but, but I'm planning to continue my development as a statistician and researcher at a pharma company. In terms of achieving my teaching goals, I see YouTube as my main platform of choice. But I have a lot to say about this later in the video, so I'll save it for now. What made you decide to go to grad school instead of stopping after your bachelor's? So like I mentioned earlier, I did biomedical engineering in university, but I didn't really do that well thanks to a combination of factors. After leaving my first job, I found myself really feeling lost and not really knowing what to do with myself. With how general biomedical engineering was, I felt like I didn't really have anything to contribute to a company and that got reflected in me really struggling to find a job after I graduated. I applied to grad school because I felt like I just didn't have many options with my current skill set after graduation. I figured that it would be easier to get a job with a master's degree in something that I really cared about, so I made a bet on it. Little did I know that it would bring me to this point many years later, talking about it on YouTube. How do you choose topics to make videos on? Is there a subject or field you think there are two videos on on YouTube? Up until now, I've actually made videos to roughly match the order in which biostatistics graduate students learn new material. You can see this in my old Very Normal Therapeutics series. Even though that's come to an end, I've continued this trend into my survival and longitudinal videos. But the longitudinal series pretty much marks the end of required classes for biostatistics students. I'm really interested in finding cool stories in the history of statistics and looking for interesting applications of statistics too, so I still have a lot to say on this channel. Off the top of my head, I'd say a limited topic on YouTube is econometrics, which is like if statistics and economics had a baby. Econometrics is really intriguing to me because the problem contexts are so different from biostatistics. So the motivations behind the models used in these fields are also very different. If someone could make a really interesting and down-to-earth econometrics channel, I think that'd be really cool. I've seen people recommend going into industry after undergrad and then doing a PhD, while others have said it's very hard to get into a PhD if you've stepped out of academia. Do you have any thoughts on this and any other comments on doing a PhD? Or any other comments on doing a PhD? I think in my particular case, I wouldn't have been able to go to a PhD right after graduating because my grades just weren't that good, so that option wasn't even really available to me. Overall, I think that getting work experience somewhere in industry can overall be helpful to having a successful PhD application. So I don't agree with the assertion that it gets harder, at least in biostatistics. I think another value point of being in industry before getting a PhD is that you get some time to figure out what you want to do. Working through a PhD program is a significant commitment, time-wise, emotionally, physically. It really, really helps to have a solid reason for being in one, since it can be a truly miserable experience sometimes. Coming into my PhD program, I knew that I treasured skills that would grant me independence and control, so that was one of my driving factors for doing it. Your reasons will probably be different, but you should know what these are before you dive in. 
What is the best thing for someone starting grad school to do to make it through and earn a PhD? I think that one of the most important skills that someone has to learn when earning a PhD is being comfortable establishing boundaries. Unfortunately, it's very easy for graduate students to be taken advantage of, be it by professors or the university, what have you. In bio statistics, it's very common for graduate students to be viewed as a source of free analysis or statistical guidance. Professional statistical consultation is expensive, and many people don't view proper statistical practice as a priority. It's important to establish with your bosses when you do your work and how much work you'll do each week. And this is especially important for teaching assistants, whose work can often surge at the worst moments. It's not just with other people, it's also a battle with yourself as well. A PhD is a realm where it can be very hard to see the line between work and rest, especially when all your work is on a computer in your apartment. It's tempting to try to get a few extra hours of work in and burn the midnight oil, but it's just not a good long-term investment. What jobs can you get with the stats degree? The main one that comes to my mind is a statistician for a pharma company, designing and running clinical trials, performing power calculations, helping other researchers plan their own experiments, and keeping updated on statistical methodology. There's also data scientist positions in tech and business. It's a common misconception that biostatisticians have to work with bio-related problems. They still have the statistical skill set to work where statistics is needed. These companies care a lot about improving their platforms or improving the efficiency of their operations, so a lot of the data you'll encounter deals with these types of problems. A cool but much lesser known job you can do as a statistician is a professional statistical programmer. R is an open source language, which is nice. We also sort of have to trust that the algorithm implementations are reliable, and that's not guaranteed. Companies like Staticore and SAS have dedicated statistical programmers that take the time to learn and produce robust statistical procedures for other people to use. This doesn't sound like much, but you actually need PhD level knowledge to actually understand novel statistical methods and implement them correctly. How much did your expectation of doing a PhD prior to starting deviate from how you experienced it? That's be boring, but I think my expectation of doing a PhD pretty much matched my experience of doing it. That is, really chill, but only if you could find someone that you work really well with. Part of what made my PhD so pleasant is that I found a research advisor that I worked really well with, and she made an active effort to make sure I was fulfilling my own career goals, and not just hers. She let me be as independent as I wanted, and she also made it a point to protect my time from other researchers who might take advantage of me. Your PhD experience greatly depends on your advisor, so really put in some time to do your due diligence about them before you commit to working with them. Most students I know don't do this, and they've had much worse experiences than mine. What were the most important classes you took as an undergrad, either for your statistics degree or just in general? You might not be expecting this, but it was definitely my first programming class. My first programming language was not R or Python, but MATLAB. This was the language of choice for engineering majors at my college. Doing statistics means doing a lot of programming, so having a solid foundation in that will have lots of downstream benefits when you're learning. I successfully used programming to help myself learn a lot of difficult concepts in statistics because I could see them in action through simulation studies. How strong was your understanding of linear algebra going into your program? What resources or strategies helped you build that understanding? To answer this question directly, my understanding of linear algebra was very weak coming into my master's program. I'd say that linear algebra would probably be the second most important class for someone in statistics to know because it's absolutely everywhere. In my first semester, I remembered the difficulty spike in the material when we moved to matrix representations for linear regression. I was lucky to have taken a linear algebra class before, so I wasn't as lost, but even then it was still pretty rough for me. To get over this weakness, the only thing I can really suggest for getting a better understanding is to get really good at asking clarifying questions to yourself. And this is a skill that will just serve you really well in general in life. You'll inevitably run into a problem that you can't solve, and often it won't be clear why you can't solve the problem. Once you figure that out, it's often much easier to do more targeted learning so that you can progress on the problem. Learning how to ask good questions really comes down to asking why to yourself a lot so that you can find the exact line between where you understand stuff and where you don't. What innovations or areas of growth do you see in biostatistics in the future? Uh, last year, David Baker, Demis Sasabis, and John Jumper won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their work on the protein folding problem. If you've never heard of this before, it's the problem of predicting the shape of a protein based on the sequence of amino acids that make it up. Their work laid the foundation for new proteins to be designed for therapeutic purposes. 
But a key fact here is that any new medicine we create needs to pass a clinical trial process before it can be approved for human use. Given that there might be hundreds or thousands of new compounds that need to be investigated, I think that there will be a greater need for statistical tools that can handle a large number of hypothesis tests and for experimental designs that can evaluate multiple compounds more efficiently than the current paradigm. Because of this, I think it's a good time to be a statistician because AI and these innovations will just keep giving us work to do. Do you think stats is taught well at schools? If not, how would you teach it instead? I think that there's too much of a separation between statistical theory and implementation in current coursework, at least at a graduate level. If I were to suggest a way to improve statistics coursework, then I'd suggest that more programming language demos be used to demonstrate statistical concepts. This would help students to get more familiar with statistical programming and enable them to play with the concepts themselves, which can be a huge benefit for learning. I try to incorporate these in my own videos, and I get the sense that they're helpful, at least from the comments. If there are three books you would recommend for learning statistics, what would you recommend and why? This is one of those questions I get a lot, so I actually dedicated an entire newsletter issue to common questions that I get. I'll update it as I notice reoccurring questions in the comments in my email inbox. You can check it out in the description and subscribe to the newsletter to keep updated with the channel. What are your thoughts on the various econometric frameworks, i.e. potential frameworks versus Perlian causal graphs? Um, I've learned them before in a causal inference class, and they seemed okay. I think potential outcomes felt a little bit more intuitive to me. You mentioned that you do design of experiments in another video. When do you think you'll do a video on that topic? I've already done one. It's this one. During the job search, did you consider applying for jobs outside of pharma? No, not really, but I was prepared to apply for data scientist jobs dealing with experimentation to expand my application pool. What is your least favorite stats variable? I think it has to be CASI. I hate that one. How do you make videos? What software or tools do you use? That's another question that's in the frequently asked questions article I mentioned earlier. So what is the future of the channel? I've already mentioned it in the video, but for those of you who didn't catch it, I'll be starting a full-time job in August, so I won't be able to dedicate as much time to this channel as I used to. I really tried to increase my activity in the first half of this year to reach my 100,000 subscriber goal, and now that I've achieved it, I think it's time for the channel to enter a new phase. In terms of videos, anticipate a much slower upload rate, maybe on the scale of one video every three to four weeks. But don't be mistaken, I don't plan to stop anytime soon. The guiding principle of this channel is to make you better at statistics. Even though I'm slowing down on the video side, I have other projects in the works to help pick up the slack, and I'm excited to share them with you today. One of these projects is what I call the Statistical Garden. It's different from a newsletter or a blog, which has more of a linear structure. This is a place where you can click on different notes and explore how different notes connect together. My goal with this project is to curate all of my knowledge that I've gained in my coursework as a graduate student. Ultimately, this garden is really just for me to preserve and build my own knowledge, but I wanted to share it with you all as well to help you on your learning journey. I plan to update it when it's convenient for me, but you can watch it grow in the process. You can visit the garden anytime at verynormal.io, and you can also find it in the description. Second, I want to start making courses and products that will have a more direct effect on making you better at statistics. The videos I make on YouTube are nice for teaching and introducing new ideas, but they're not so great for making sure that others can actually use them in practice. For full disclosure, I plan for these to be paid products, but I promise to you that I'll do my best to make sure that it's worth your hard-earned money. It'll be a learning process, but I'm excited to take the step. That's it for this one. Thank you again for 100,000 subscribers. 1 million is a big number, but we'll get there eventually. No rush. I'll see you in the next one.